We live in a world that can seem terrifying, unstable, and unpredictable. Many people are wondering what will happen next. Among the symbols in the books of Daniel and Revelation are terrifying beasts emerging from stormy seas, a supernatural stone demolishing a massive multi-metallic statue, four cryptic horsemen, and the Son of Man standing at the center of seven burning candlesticks. Yet, at the center of it all is the main message. There's a loving creator who cares about you and has a plan for your life. The Long Island District of Seventh-day Adventist Churches invites you to join us on this adventure in Bible prophecy. Beginning November 7th at 7 p.m., the meetings will be live streamed on the Long Island District YouTube channel and on the Stephen Seventh-day Adventist Church Facebook page. Meetings will also be broadcast in Long Island on the Shaw Word radio station, 98.9 FM. We invite you to join us for four weeks as we unlock the books of Daniel and Revelation. like to give a warm welcome to our friends on Facebook, YouTube, Shoreward Radio Station, and to those who are worshiping in the sanctuary. A pleasant good night to all. Meetings will be held at the Stephen Seventh-day Adventist Church in Scrub Hill on Sunday and Wednesday 
and live streamed only on YouTube and Facebook. Off nights will be Friday and Saturday nights. As we're in our second week of unlocking the book of Daniel and Revelation, if you've missed the first week, don't be alarmed. You can go on YouTube at Long Island District and click on each night you've missed. We've received an extra blessing yesterday during our 11 a.m. service. The topic was a counterfeit within Christianity part three. Tonight's topic is the lamb that died. Get your Bible, pen, and notepad ready as we follow along with our pastor as he allow God to lead and direct him. Please stand for the opening song, Above All Powers. We stand as we sing our theme song above all. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom, and all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone, you live to die. Rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all, above all power. Above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what your worth crucified laid behind a stone you live to die 
rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all crucified crucified led behind the stone you live to die rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Jessica, for leading us in that beautiful song. At this time, I want to invite you to bow with me for the opening prayer. Let us pray. Father, we adore you tonight. You are the uncreated loving, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God. And we praise you and we thank you for sending Jesus to come and to die for us. Like a rose trampled on the ground, he took the fall and he thought of each one of us above all. As we prepare to hear from your word tonight, once again, we ask your special blessing on our meeting. We pray for our dear friends in Radio Land, our dear friends on YouTube and Facebook. Please prepare their hearts that they may receive the word with gladness. And I pray for myself that you would use me to your glory. Bless us and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, you, might, you may be seated. At this time, we're going to move into our questions and answer segment. And we are not going to be answering any questions tonight, but we will take this time to remind you to go ahead and to send in your questions. You can do it in the Facebook chat, in the YouTube chat, or you can send it to the Long Island Gmail account, which I will put up on the screen as I also take this opportunity to remind you of our free digital book offer. Yes, so two things. Number one, if you would like a free PDF digital book, uh, you can send an email to us at Long Island SDA. that's S as in seventh, D as in day, A as in Adventist, at gmail.com, or you can send a text message or a WhatsApp message to 1-242-557-3535. You can also have the option of using these contacts for your Bible questions, okay? So if you don't want to post them publicly inside the YouTube and Facebook chats, you can send your Bible question to either one of these contact addresses. Lastly, before we get into the Word of God, I want to invite you to be a digital disciple. Share the YouTube link on your WhatsApp status. Share the Facebook link on your WhatsApp status to your WhatsApp groups, to a friend, to a family member. We're going to be opening God's word once again. And if you have been being blessed, you can imagine how much another person 
will be blessed if you take the time to share the links. So if you are on Facebook, go ahead and share that to your news feed. And let's spread the word, the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we're going to prepare for a special item of music uh, coming from a wonderful youth group from Exuma. And so while we get the music up for you, uh, we want you to um, just stay tuned and be blessed.
and okay so that was actually a group named special blend special blend from the exuma district of churches a youth group and uh, we are thankful for that rendition once again welcome 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 we are so happy to have all of those online in radio land and also right here in the sanctuary uh, this evening as you can see on the screen our topic is the lamb that died the lamb that died and so as we go into god's word once again we are going to just have another prayer and uh, uh, the song says now dear lord as we pray take our hearts and our minds far away from the cares of this life all around to your throne where grace doth abound and it ends by saying let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer and so that's what we want to do we want to invite all of you everywhere to join us as we come to the lord in prayer our heads are bowed our eyes are closed let us pray mighty god everlasting father you are faithful and ever true and in your word you say that if we ask we shall receive if we seek we shall find and if we knock the door shall be opened unto us we're so thankful that we can count on your precious promises father i am kindly asking that as i stand behind this sacred desk once again that you would put your hand upon me as you did for the prophet jeremiah i pray that you'll put your words in my mouth and as you did for isaiah may you touch my lips with a live coal from your altar please purge me for i am an unclean man dwelling in the midst of an unclean people may your word go forth with the power and conviction of the holy spirit may our friends in the sanctuary to the various internet platforms and in radio land hear a word from you as i avail myself to be used thank you for having heard thank you for having answered is my humble prayer in jesus name amen okay so as we get into the message for this evening we are going to just do a little bit of review we have just come out of a study of the books of daniel chapter 7 and 8 and what a study it was what a relationship daniel had with god to receive these wonderful revelations that span from his day to our time and even forward to the second coming of christ in daniel chapter 8 we learned that the sanctuary was presented as the focal point of the desolation caused by the little horn of Daniel 8. We learned that this little horn represented Rome in two phases. First, its pagan phase, and secondly, its papal phase. Now, tonight and tomorrow night, by the grace of the Lord, we will study the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary sanctuary we will note in particular the services performed in connection with the sanctuary on a day-by-day -day basis and also those services that were only performed once every year as we talk about the book of daniel we want to also discover what that judgment scene we didn't really go into it in detail but in Daniel 7, Daniel says he saw one like the Son of Man being brought to the Ancient of Days. The Son of Man we know is Jesus. The Ancient of Days, God the Father. What was this scene all about? It says that the thrones were set up and the books were opened. This was clearly a scene of judgment. But we want to learn some more about that. And we also want to find out what does it mean when Daniel 8 speaks about this cleansing of the sanctuary. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary all about and how does it affect you and me? Before we can explore these very relevant and exciting topics, we have to ensure 
that we understand what the sanctuary was all about. So that's where we'll start our questions tonight. And question number one is, what did God ask Moses and the people of Israel to do? And why did he ask them to do it? Uh, to find our answer, we turn to Exodus 25, verses 8 and 22. Exodus 25, verses 8 and 22. And as we are turning there, let me go ahead and welcome our special friends online. I see some family, some church family members. My mother, Sister Michelle, Sister Opal, Sister Paulette, Enid Roll, Joy Khan, Jalitha Humes, Paulette Thompson, all familiar names and faces. Linda Gibson are from right here in Long Island. Uh, good to see Sister Violet and Disha, if you are listening in, I welcome you as well. And Macklin, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, so good to have you. I know that some of you have been expressing how you're being blessed by the messages from the books of Daniel and Revelation. If you haven't done so as yet, please take the time to share the link, share the blessing with someone else. All right, now we're ready for Exodus 25, verses 8 and 22. And so if you're home and you have your Bibles, you don't have to look at the screen. It's always good to go to the, the hard copy, but this is just for those who don't have access to a Bible. So what does the Bible say in Exodus 25, verse 8? We are answering two questions. What did God ask the Israelites and Moses to do and why? We find our answer in verse 8. And let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. Wow, what a loving God. Let's go to verse 22. And there, and just for context, he had already been speaking about the different parts of the sanctuary, the different items. And as he spoke about the Ark of the Covenant, he says, and there from the top of the Ark of the Covenant called the mercy seat, I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. Listen to this. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, of all things which I will give thee, in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, yesterday at 11 a.m., we saw a picture where the Bishop of Rome was seated on a throne between two cherubim. And we see where it comes from. That is actually the setting that God himself explained uh, to the Israelites. He told them to make a replica of what his throne is like in heaven. But we see the one identified as the little horn power, seated, as it were, in a replica of the throne of God. So we see how all of these things are coming together. So to review, what did God say? He said, listen, I want you to build me a sanctuary. And we asked the why. Why? God said, so that I can dwell among you. God wants to dwell among his people. You know, many times we just look at God as a big boss, the big ruler, the mighty creator. But we sometimes have a tendency to forget that he is a relational God. God has emotions. He has feelings. And he loves being connected with us. And even though he had to drive Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden when they disobeyed him, I don't want you to think that he did it with a cold heart, stoic and stole it, and he didn't feel any way about it. No, he wasn't stoic. He was hurt. And he wanted to come back into connection, into community with his faithful people, with his creation. And the sanctuary was a means of reconnecting that gap that sin had caused. See, the Bible says in Isaiah 59 that sin separates us from God. So the sanctuary was a mean of bridging the gap. God is all about getting us back into his presence. And I cannot fail. I cannot say it too much, rather. We should never forget that this earth is not our final resting home. It's not our final dwelling place. No way can God be satisfied when he is all the way up there in the throne room of heaven, God the Father, and Jesus ministering before him. 
Even though the spirit of God is here, the Bible says that God wants us to be where he is. God wants us to see him face to face. He wants us to be able to communicate with him as Adam and Eve once did before sin separated them. So you and I should never be content with having this long distance relationship. We should be looking forward to that day when face to face we'll see him. Face to face we'll see him as he is. And the sanctuary was all about making that restoration of relationship a possibility. Question number two. How would Moses know how to build a sanctuary or a tabernacle? How would he know? Did he have to go to architecture school? Uh, did he have to consult with the Israelites and uh, ask them what they think it should look like? How would he know? The Bible tells us in Exodus 25 verse 40, And look that thou make them after their pattern which will show thee in the mount. Look that thou make the different aspects of the sanctuary after the pattern. God gave Moses a pattern to follow. Similarly, he told Noah how to build the ark. And Noah didn't have to figure it out himself. God gave them the blueprint and they just followed it. And I want to let you know that if you read the details of the sanctuary, you see that God was very detailed. He went into the measurements. He went into the material to be used. I mean, he went into fine detail about how this tabernacle should be built. Why would he take such care to every detail? Well, there are two reasons. Number one, the sanctuary and its services were all meant to teach the Israelites, and even to teach you and me today, about God's great plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. So every detail was a message pointing to Jesus, my friends. Secondly, the sanctuary on earth was, as it were, a copy or a replica of the sanctuary in heaven. I want to let somebody know there is a sanctuary in heaven. And Jesus is the high priest of that sanctuary. But tonight, we're not going to deal too much with the high priestly aspect. We are dealing with the lamb that died tonight. So there you have it, my friends. The word of God is answering our questions. Number three, where is the true sanctuary that served as the pattern for the earthly sanctuary? I just told you, but let me do it again, this time from the word of God. Hebrews 8, verses 1 to 5, as we find the answer to where is the true sanctuary that served as the pattern for the earthly sanctuary. The Bible says in Hebrews 8, 1 to 5, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an what? An high priest who was set where? On the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary, and look at this, of the what kind of tabernacle? The true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Moses and the Israelites pitched the earthly sanctuary, but the heavenly sanctuary was not made by man. It was made by divinity. Wherefore, it is of a necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. That's verse 5. Of seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern show to thee in the mount. Now, uh, let's backtrack. Something here is very interesting. We're going to discuss it. This part that says, the example and shadow of heavenly things. We're going to touch on that. What does that mean? The example and shadow of heavenly things. 
Well, two words are commonly used in connection with the sanctuary. They are the words type and anti-type. We had a sermon about this not too long ago here in the Stevens Church. The type represents and points to the anti-type. The heavenly sanctuary is the original sanctuary and is therefore the anti-type. The sanctuary at Sinai was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. It was the earthly type or model, which points to the anti-type in heaven. Now let's break it down. There was a pastor who was serving as a counselor at a youth campsite. They had a camp meeting, uh, I think it was every year. And it was his job to keep an eye on the young boys. And if any of you parents have young boys, you know that sometimes young boys can get into mischief if you don't keep your eyes on them. So the young children, they always had a time for nap, nap time. And this one boy in particular, uh, the, the, the pastor could always expect this little boy to get into some mischief. And so one day as the pastor was looking around, he was noticing all of the little children sleeping on their mats. Uh, when he looked at the mat of the little mischief maker, he was nowhere to be found. So the pastor went out to look for this little troublesome Tom. And what would he find as he was about to turn around the corner? Guess what he saw? He saw a shadow from behind the building. And as he looked at the shadow, he could determine the height of the little one. Uh, he, he could tell by the shadow that it was the little boy. He couldn't see his face. He couldn't see the colors of his clothing. But just the shadow uh, that was being cast on the ground from behind the corner, the pastor knew that the little boy was trying to hide from him. So the little boy didn't, I don't think he was. Pointed pastor to the reality that the little boy was around the corner. So the earthly sanctuary is just a shadow that teaches us about the real sanctuary in heaven. When we talk about types and anti-types, we cannot get every full detail by looking at the shadowy types but we can learn a little about the reality of which they point toward. Let's go to question number four. What articles of furniture were in the first part of the tabernacle? What articles of furniture were in the first part of the tabernacle? Yes, this tent, this sanctuary that Moses and the Israelites built it was really split into two. It had a yard, it had a, a fence, as it were, around it, and then the building itself had two parts. We want to find out what was contained in the first part of the tabernacle. Remember, all of this teaches us about Jesus. Hebrews 9 verse 2 says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the what? The candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Yes, the candlestick was there, seven branch candlestick. The table and the showbread, David would have ate of the showbread when he was on the run from King Saul. That wasn't a common thing, uh, but he was in hot pursuit. He was being, he was in pursuit rather. Um, Saul was in pursuit of David and David was famished with his men and David ate of the showbread. Uh, so that's what it's actually speaking of. Let's go to Exodus 30, verses 1 and 6, and learn what else was in that first compartment. There's the table of showbread. There's the seven-branch candlestick. But we also learn that there was something else, a third item. Exodus 30, verse 1 says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shit and wood shalt thou make it. Verse 6, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. And if you look on the screen, you see a curtain, as it were. That curtain, we're going to discover, separated the first apartment or the first part of the tabernacle from the second part of the tabernacle. 
The first part was known as the holy place. The second part, beyond the veil, was called the most holy place. Now, what things were in the second apartment known as the most holy place? What would be seen by the high priest as he transitioned from the first apartment into the second apartment? Hebrews 9 verses 3 to 5 explains. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the most holy place, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. Exodus chapters 25 up to chapter 40 tells us in detail about this sanctuary. In 1 Kings chapter 5, 6, and 7, we read about Solomon's larger and more permanent temple. And that was built in Jerusalem several hundred years later. So we've covered the scriptures. Now let's take some visual aid. Let's look at the visual aid so we can get a better picture of what this earthly tabernacle looked like. So there you have it. This is what the Israelites would see. Uh, that wall, as it were, made out of linen, was containing the courtyard. There was only one entrance into the courtyard, only one door. Again, all of this teaches us about Jesus. Jesus is the door to salvation. There is only one way to Christ, one way to the Father, rather, and that is we must come through Christ Jesus. We cannot make it to heaven if we try and get in some other way. There was only one way into the courtyard. And this teaches us that for you and me to be saved, it doesn't matter how much money we donate to charity. It doesn't matter how much good deeds we do while that is nice. We are only saved by coming to the Father through Christ Jesus. And everyone who would be saved, it will be because of Christ Jesus. Jesus is the door. He is the door. Now, once you got in that door, you would see the altar of sacrifice. Uh, that was where the, the light was hovering over. Right there, that's the altar of sacrifice. This is where the sacrificial animals were burnt. The altar represents the cross, my friends. You see, for all individuals who have lived in the world, for them to be saved, they have to make their way to the sanctuary, as it were. They have to make a choice to leave the world and come in search of salvation. They make their way. They, they, they realize that they have to look into Jesus.
Sorry about that, my friends. We had a little power outage here in Long Island, but we still press forward because like the psalmist, the Lord is our light. Amen. All right. So let's let's press forward in Jesus name. We were just talking about the sanctuary and we mentioned that when somebody wants salvation, they have to be willing to leave the world. We cannot remain in the world and be saved by the lamb that died. No, my friends, we are either in with Christ or we are outside in the world. And those who find themselves dabbling in the worldliness of sin, sadly, Jesus cannot save them. Because Jesus loves the sinner, but sin is offensive to God. And so I want to ask the questions. Maybe there's a Christian listening. I want you to be reminded that the Holy Spirit wants us to know that we have to make a choice. We cannot be holy on one day of the week and partaking in sin the other six days. No, Jesus wants it all. And so the sinner must be willing to give up the sinful things and, and come in search of salvation. He will find it through Christ. And once he comes to the sanctuary, the first thing that he should cast his eyes upon or cast her eyes upon is the fact that Jesus went to the altar to save him or her. The altar was, the altar was the place where the lamb was slain. The, sometimes they would use goats or other clean animals. But the first thing we need to know to experience salvation is that Jesus died to save us. And then after you pass the altar, the next thing that you would see in the courtyard is the laver. The laver contained the water, and this was where the priests would wash themselves. After we see and we realize that Jesus died to save us, we must be washed by the water of baptism. The Bible tells us in the book of Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And as we continue to explore how the little horn desolated the sanctuary, I want to let you know that the little horn has a substitute for baptism. The Roman church has a practice where infants are sprinkled and that is considered as baptism. But my friends, that is not a biblical practice. Jesus was not sprinkled. We see Jesus as of age. He was an adult. He knew the difference between right from wrong. He went down to the Jordan River and he was baptized as an example for you and for me. So if you have been baptized any other way than what the Bible outlines, I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit is calling you to be baptized according to the word of God. You must go to the labor, my friends, and be washed, symbolizing your faith in the blood of Christ. So those were the articles in the courtyard. To the courtyard, the next step would be to move further into the holy place now only the priests could go into the holy place the high priest could also go here but the common israelite was not allowed to go to the holy place the holy place contained the table of showbread that we referenced a while ago the candlestick and the altar of incense where every day the priests performed rituals and ceremonies with all of their special meanings. Yes, my friends. So let's take a look at the example there. Right there is the table of showbread to the north. And next you have the seven branch candlestick. And then right before the veil is the altar of incense. This would be what was contained in the holy place. Now, the high priest went past the veil into the most holy place once a year. And what would he see as he went into the, into the most holy place? 
he would see the Ark of the Covenant. And he would go here on the great day of atonement, which is called Yom Kippur. Inside the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of it, the mercy seat with the two cherubim, the two angelic beings, their wings folded together. And they were above the Ten Commandments. The Ark was a box covered in gold. The cover was called the mercy seat. On that cover, figures of angels. Inside the Ark were two tablets with the Ten Commandments written on them. Here we have the relationship of mercy and the law. The law is an important part of the covenant, but there is divine mercy to cover mistakes again that are committed within the special covenant relationship between God and his people. So God's law requires all of us to be holy and obedient. The Bible says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father. God doesn't want, to, uh, want us to be mistaken in thinking that we can just live willy-nilly. We can sin and ask for forgiveness when we feel like it and then plan to go out and sin and then come back to the Lord. No, that's not how it works. We have to strive to be children of God who please him because we love him the same way that if a child wants to show respect to their parents, as the commandment says they ought to, honor thy mother and father if you want your days to be long. If a child wants to honor their parents, then they should be obedient out of love. And if we want to honor our heavenly father, we should strive to live a life of obedience. Now, are there going to be times when the children are going to make mistakes? Of course. But they will show repentance. They will show sorrow. And mommy and daddy, good parents, sometimes they may have to correct them. But a good parent knows that they must give their child some time. They must accept the fact that their child is going to make some mistakes. Uh, so forgiveness takes a place in any parent-child relationship. And so too, God understands that, we, that there will be times when we mess up. All we need to do is confess our sins, forsake them, and God will pick us right back up. Question number six. What happened when the sanctuary was completed? Let's read from Exodus 40. Exodus chapter 40, verses 33 and 34. It says, so Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the Israelites had finished constructing this earthly edifice, God's presence filled the sanctuary. He came to dwell with his people. I want you to take a journey there in your mind. Try to imagine if you were an Israelite. And the final thing had been set up on that sanctuary. And all of a sudden, you see a cloud. The pillar representing God's presence descending above that tent. And then the glory of the Lord fills that building. Oh, how thrilling and reassuring that would have been to see a symbol of the presence of God in the middle of the camp. Now, let's move on to question number seven. And question number seven asks us, question number seven says, how often were lambs to be offered as burnt offerings? How often were lambs to be offered as burnt offerings? To find our answer, we want to go to Numbers 28, verses 3 and 4. There it says, and thou shalt say unto them, this is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord. Two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day, for a continual burnt offering. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even or at evening time. So every single day, lambs were to be sacrificed for the congregation, one in the morning and one in the evening. Question number eight. If a person sinned, what was required for them to receive forgiveness? 
What was required for a sinner to receive forgiveness? To find the answer, we go to Leviticus 6, 1, 2, and 3, and Leviticus 6, verses 6 and 7. It tells us, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or have found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram, which is a male sheep, a ram without blemish, out of the flock, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. Yes, my friend. So the person who was truly repentant had to show that they were sorrowful by making a sacrifice. They had to take not some scrappy lamb, not some, not any and any ram or lamb that they felt like, but they had to pick a perfect lamb, a lamb without spot, a lamb without blemish. And they had to bring that lamb to the sanctuary. You see, there was a, a work that they had to do that the priest could not do for them. And so too, my friends, there's a work that you and I have to do that Jesus cannot do for us. We have to make a choice. As the song says, I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back because I want to follow Jesus someday. Or oh, I want to let some young person know it's good to hear mommy and daddy praying for you. But there's going to come a time when you need to make a decision to follow Jesus for yourself. Or oh, that it's good to have parents or grandparents who tell you, hey, let's go to church. But there's going to come a time in your life where if no mommy and daddy is around, you will still make up in your mind that I am going to get showered, get dressed, and go and hear the word of God because I realize that I cannot live by food alone, but I must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The sinner had to make a decision to go and to take that lamb to the priest. The priest could not do that for them. And then the sinner himself had to take a knife and cut that poor innocent animal's throat and the blood would flow. You see, the Bible, as we're going to learn, tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. This is what the Israelites had to learn. Sin is not something to play around with. Every time an individual sins, death follows, my friend. Death is the result of sin. And the Israelites were to do this because they were to learn that one day the perfect spotless Lamb of God would come to this earth to be killed for their sins. Uh, the sinner had to bring a lamb to the sanctuary, confess his or her sins on the head of that animal, and then take that animal's life. The wages of sin is death. Now, after the sinner had done this, what would the priest do? Again, there was a work that the sinner had to do. And then when the sinner did their work, they could do no more. They had to depend on the priest to finish the process. So what would the priest do next? Leviticus 4 verses 5 and 6 says, And the priest that is anointed shall take of the blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. Besides the daily sacrifices for the whole camp, there was the opportunity for everyone who felt convicted of sin to bring a perfect lamb to the courtyard. Again, the priest would make general sacrifices every morning and every evening. But if an individual felt convicted of sin, they had the opportunity to bring a perfect lamb to the courtyard. When they had done that, confessed their sins, and killed the animal, 
the priest would catch that blood, take the animal's blood into the holy place and sprinkle it before that curtain, before that veil of the most holy place. All of this was to teach that the sinner's forgiveness required their sin to be removed from them and placed onto the lamb. The lamb would then take that sin into the sanctuary, or rather the priest would then take uh, that sin into the sanctuary. Uh, let me take some time here and flesh it out a little bit more. There's a scripture that tells us, well, it's, it's, it's going to come up. I'm going to share it on the screen for our friends online. But there's a scripture that says that the life of the flesh was in the blood. So if I sinned, I must lay my hands on the head of the sacrificial animal. And symbolically, as I confess and take responsibility for my sin, that sin would be removed from me and symbolically placed on the lamb. When the lamb is killed, that sin would now symbolically be present in its blood. The blood would be taken into the sanctuary by the priest. So this was some of the steps that were required to receive forgiveness. Let's move on to question number 10. And here is the scripture I was pointing out earlier. What is necessary before sin can be forgiven? Hebrews 9, 22 says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Someone had to die so that you and I could have salvation. And this ought to stir up in our hearts an allegiance to the Lamb of God. Have you ever heard that song? I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Oh, because he died for us, this should pull from our deepest recesses of our souls an allegiance that we will be loyal to him, that we will trust him, that we will honor him because he died to save us. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so let's look at a few scriptures and another illustration. Leviticus 4, 27 and 28 says, And if any one of the common people sin." Then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin, which he hath sinned. In chapter 4, verse 32, we also see that they could bring a lamb. So let's look at this illustration. Let's say that this person is the sinner. They have broken one of God's commandment. They are convicted that sin is on their conscience. They know that they have done wrong. This individual would have to bring his sacrificial animal to the sanctuary, place his hands upon the animal's head, confess his sin. Leviticus 4.29 tells us this, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. He had to place his hands on that animal's head. Uh, this was symbolic. It says here, day by day, the repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle and placing his hand upon the victim's head, confessed his sins, thus in figure, transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. The animal was then slain. So there it is. Uh, the sin is removed from the sinner, placed onto the animal. That animal is slain. What happens next as the blood gushes? From the animal's throat verse 40 leviticus 4 verse 30 sorry leviticus 4 verse 30 and the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar for the life of the flesh leviticus 17 11 is in the blood that animal was the substitute for the sinner. Because the animal died, the sinner was pardoned from dying for his or her sin. And so then that priest would sometime, the blood would be co collected and that would symbolize where the sin is. And then he would take that sin and put it on the altar of burnt offering. 
Sometimes you'd put it on the altar of burnt offering, and there were also occasions where it would be taken into the tabernacle and sprinkled on the altar of incense before the veil and put on the horns of the altar of incense. So there you have it, my friends. All of this was to teach us about what Jesus would come and accomplish. Whose blood cleanses us from sin? A goat, a lamb, a bullock. The blood of these animals cannot perfectly cleanse us from sin. They were all shadows pointing us to a greater reality. The reality that Jesus Christ would come and be slain for us. First John 1 verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Question number 12. What did God put on the messianic lamb? What did God put on the messianic lamb? We go to Isaiah 53, a beautiful chapter about what Jesus did for us. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 8. The prophet asks, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is speaking about Christ. And this does not mean that Christ was not an attractive man. It simply meant he didn't focus on decorating his external. He wasn't focused on showing off. He wasn't focused on uh, the fashions of the day. He came as a humble man. He didn't want anyone to be drawn to him because of the name brand shoes he had. He didn't want anyone to be attracted to him because he was wearing a gold chain. He didn't want anyone to be attracted to him because of the temporal possessions that he had, but he wanted all who came to him to come to him because of the words of life that he was speaking, because of his character. And this is a perfect lesson for our young people today. It matters not how attractive we look on the outside. What God is concerned about is our heart. And that is what Jesus wanted to demonstrate. It's all about, is our heart beautiful? Christ was of a beautiful character. He was trustworthy. He kept his word. He wasn't deceitful. He wasn't selfish. He wasn't prejudiced. He wasn't a racist. He wasn't cocky. He didn't show off. He was very humble and meek. He didn't want anyone to desire him because of an outward beauty. And the true Christian will be displaying this principle. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. My friend, do you feel sad sometimes? Maybe you reflect on some sad memories. Maybe you've been through some really difficult periods of your life and nobody understands. I want to let you know that Jesus has carried that grief for you. You feel sorrowful and sad sometimes. I want to let you know that Jesus, he took that sorrow that you are feeling upon himself. He bore that for you so that you don't have to live a life of sadness and grief. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus was beaten with the cat and nine tail. Those iron hooks tore the flesh out of his back. He was lacerated and whipped. Blood was strewn all over the floor as the Roman soldiers flex their mice, their biceps, and they reach that cat of nine tail whip back, and they plunged it into his flesh. He was wounded for our sins, not because he had done wrong, but because you and me, we did wrong. 
He died for our sins again because the wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. And Jesus took the place of everyone who would accept his sacrifice. He was bruised for our iniquities. Because he was beaten, because of his stripes, you and I can receive healing. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus took our iniquities upon himself. That's how much he loves us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers is dumb, so he opened, so he openeth not his mouth. Not a murmur, not a complaint went out of the lips of Jesus. Not a murmur, not a complaint went out of the lips of Jesus. Verse 8 says, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Yes, this is what Jesus did for us. What did God put on the messianic lamb? He put our sins he put our iniquities upon Jesus. Jesus took it, as the song says. Above all, he thought of us, and he went to the cross above all. I have already said it, but let's go to the word of God and find out who was the messianic lamb and what exactly did he do. John chapter 1 and verse 29 gives us the answer. John 1 and verse 29. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Bible says that after Adam and Eve sinned, they felt an, an emotion that they had never experienced, guilt and shame. They ran and they hid themselves. They used to be covered in light, but as they sinned, the light disappeared. They found themselves naked in the presence of a holy God. They went and they tried to cover their private parts with fig leaves, but it was only aprons. It could not suffice. The Bible says that God had to give them clothes. God gave them coats. And that coat, it said it was coats of skins. An animal had to be sacrificed for Adam and Eve to receive clothing. Adam had to make a sacrifice for his sin. And then God clothed them properly. He didn't want them walking around half naked. He clothed them with the garments made from the lamb that was sacrificed. And every lamb that was slain from the time of Adam until the death of Christ represented Jesus. He died as the perfect lamb for the sins of the world. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22 tells us this. God had said from the beginning that the sinner would have to die for his sin. Genesis 2, verse 17, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Ezekiel 18 says, the soul that sins, he shall die. But in Genesis 3.15, God promised that someone would die for Adam. Someone would die for the human race. Throughout the centuries, every single person who confessed their sins on the head of the lamb, which was the type, showed their faith in God's promise of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who was the anti-type. Their faith was justified. And when Jesus died for the sins of mankind, they could receive pardon. Jesus, who was truly God in heaven, came down and became a man living with us, identifying with us, and then he gave himself 
as the infinite sacrifice so that he could save us to the uttermost, my friends. Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, he is with us to the end. Our final question for tonight. What, what happened in the sanctuary? What happened in the sanctuary when Jesus died? What happened in the sanctuary when Jesus died? Mark 15, 37 and 38 holds the answer. Mark 15, 37 and 38. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost and the veil of the temple was rent or torn in twain, torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now, what is interesting about this is, is it doesn't say that the, the curtain was torn from the bottom to the top. No, it was torn from the top to the bottom. A divine hand tore that thing in half to demonstrate that there was no longer any need for those symbols. The true lamb had been sacrificed on Golgotha's hill. Jesus had fulfilled his mission. He came and died as our perfect spotless lamb of God. This is why we don't need to go to any priests on this earth. At the time when Christ died and this curtain was torn, it signaled the end of the need for an earthly sanctuary and earthly services. God wanted us now to direct our minds up to heaven where Jesus himself would become our high priest. We don't have to look to any man. We don't have to confess to any earthly priest. We have a high priest up in heaven, my friends. And so in conclusion, if we take a closer look at this sanctuary, we see a message of love that was encoded thousands of years before Jesus was manifested in the flesh. If we connect the dots from the altar of sacrifice, the labor, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread and the seven branch candlestick, if we connect the dots, my friends, we see a cross. Yes, the sanctuary was pointing us to Jesus. It pointed us to the cross Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The sanctuary was to direct our minds to the fact that Jesus would come to die for you and for me. And so, my friends, uh, that brings us to the end of our message tonight. And I want to let someone know that God wants us, every last one of us listening, to ensure that we have went through the sanctuary. Oh, my friend, if you have not yet recognized that Jesus died for you, if you have not seen him lifted up, tonight he wants you to know that he died just to save you. You might have done wrong. You might have uh, sinned. You might be an alcoholic. You might have been uh, an abuser of your spouse. You might have committed all sorts of wrong, but Jesus wants to let you know if you would put your faith in him like the thief on the cross did, Jesus will take those sins upon himself. He will consider you innocent. And because he died on Calvary's cross, your sins can be pardoned. But after this, Jesus wants you to follow along, to go past the altar and to go to the labor to be baptized. Is there anyone tuning in? You have not yet been baptized. That's the next step that Jesus wants you to take. You have to go down into the watery grave of baptism, symbolizing that you want to die to sin. And when the minister brings you up out of that water, it is a symbol that you want to walk in a new life by faith in Jesus Christ. But even after you have been baptized, it still doesn't end there. 
The table of show bread, the bread represents the word of God. We cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You have to spend time in God's word to hear his voice. The altar of incense represents prayer. Your prayers must ascend like the sweet incense that rose up over the veil. You must develop a prayer life. Talk to God. He wants to hear from you. And when you are reading your Bible and praying, he wants you to be a light like the seven branch candlestick, to go and light up your corner, to share your faith, to share the fact that Jesus came to save sinners, to point your family and friends to Christ. And as you engage in this process, God will take your heart and he will transform it. He will write your law on his heart. You will not want to sin, but like Christ, you will want to please your father. You will delight to do his will. He will write his law on your heart. I'm going to call my wife up shortly. She's going to sing an appeal song. And then I want to pray for somebody. If you are on YouTube, if you are on Facebook, if you are listening on the radio, I want to let you know that Jesus is calling you to make a decision for him. He wants you to be saved. He is saying, don't put it off until tomorrow. Do it now. Give your heart to Jesus. Be baptized and make a commitment to follow him all the way where he leads you. And Jessica is going to come at this time. I know you had me on your mind when you climbed upon that hill, for you saw me with eternal light. While I was yet in sin, Redeemer, Savior, Friend, every stripe upon your battered back, every thorn that pierced your brow. And every nail drove deep through guiltless hands Says that your love knows no end Redeemer, Savior, Friend Redeemer Redeem my heart again, Savior, come and shelter me from sin. You're familiar with my weakness, devoted to the end. Redeemer, Savior, friend. The grace you've poured out on my life will return to you in praise. And I'll gladly lay down all my crowns for the name by which I'm saved. For the name by which I'm saved. Redeemer, redeem my heart again. Please, Savior, 
Come and shelter me from sin. You're familiar with and Redeemer, Savior, friend. Oh, Redeemer, redeem my heart again. Savior, come and shelter me from sin. You're familiar with my weakness, devoted to the end. Redeemer, Savior, friend. Oh. My Savior and friend. Thank you, Jessica. Amen. And so, as I pray for someone tonight, is there someone on YouTube and on Facebook? You hear the voice of God speaking to you at this time. Maybe you used to walk with Jesus, but by your choices, by your lifestyle, you demonstrated to the world that you had left him. And now you sense him calling you to start anew. Or you need to be baptized again. Just as if a couple were to be divorced, they cannot automatically start living together and be recognized as married. They have to be married once again. Maybe you strayed away from God tonight. You hear the Spirit's voice saying, I need to get back to Jesus. Make a decision tonight. Reach out to us. Send us a message. Let us know, I want to be baptized. Secondly, maybe you have never been baptized, but you realize that you cannot live without Christ any longer. You are ready to make him your savior, your redeemer and friend. Reach out to us, send us a message, let us know, I want to be baptized. I want to be a Christian. I want to begin my journey with Jesus. I'm going to say a prayer for us at this time. For those of us in the sanctuary who are already walking with the Lord, if it is your desire to have a new experience with him day by day, to continue to grow in your love for Jesus, why not stand with me as I say a prayer for us? Heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Thank you, Lord, for the sanctuary that shows us your plan to save us. We pray for those who need to make a decision, that they would hasten to your call and run to your arms of safety. For as we started off, we learned that you are coming back and you want them to be safe with you. Please hear their, pra hear their prayer, hear their hearts cry. Help them to make that decision. For those of us who have already given our hearts to you, Lord, may we grow in love with you every single day. Thank you, Lord, for having heard and answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a wonderful night. We continue tomorrow, same time, same place. In the sense of internet-wise, we will not be in the sanctuary, but we will be on YouTube, on Facebook, and in Radio Land tomorrow, 7 p.m., as we continue to look at the sanctuary. Have a wonderful night, and may God bless you.